I'm Pyle Coley, and I'm here at ACC 2012, and I have with me Do Dr. Rita Redberg, Professor of Medicine at University of California, San Francisco, and we're here to discuss a recent controversy that's emerged. Now, Do Dr. Redberg, there's no question in anyone's mind that statins are effective and prolong life for people who have known coronary disease. But as you know, a debate has recently emerged, both in the Wall Street Journal as well as this month's CardioSource World News issue at in which you have voiced some of your opinions. I wondered, could you summarize for me your viewpoint on statins in primary prevention or people who don't have previous coronary disease? Sure, I'd be happy to, Kyle. So we published a meta-analysis about a year and a half ago in the Archives of Internal Medicine that looked at statins for primary prevention. And that data summarized all of the randomized trials. Most of them were done in high-risk patients because that is where you would most likely expect to see the benefit. Um, the first author was Ray. And there was no benefit on all-cause mortality. And for primary prevention, as opposed to secondary prevention, we're talking about people who are healthy. And so when you're taking care of healthy people, you know, they already feel good. So, you know, I feel our job as doctors is to help people either feel better or help them to live longer. Okay, healthy, these are people that already feel good, so we're not helping them to feel better by giving them any medicines. So then our focus for primary prevention for medicines is helping them to live longer. And so there aren't any studies that show that statins help people to live longer for primary prevention. And that is why I do not feel that we have evidence to justify the recommendations and the guidelines that recommend statins for use of, in primary prevention. Interesting. So tell me, is there a patient in, in whom you would prescribe a statin for primary prevention? And if so, what are the factors that would sway you and what sort of clinical characteristics would that patient have? Yeah. You know, I, I don't like to be absolute, so I wouldn't say never. You know, it's possible that in a very high-risk patient who had a very strong family history, had was a male, Framingham risk score over 20, 20 percent, that perhaps... Um, I would, they would benefit from statins if they had very high cholesterol. But, you know, I really, I mean, I want my patients to feel good and live longer. I don't want them to die of heart disease, and I work very hard with them to try to reduce their risk factors. But I work hard with them on eating the right foods, eating more fruits and vegetables, making sure they get physical activity, making sure they don't smoke. And that's how I really feel that I am helping them to prevent heart disease and to live longer and to feel better. Because I see patients every week in clinic who are miserable because they've been put on statins. They have, they're very low-risk patients. A lot of them are women who, when I do their risk profile, it's 2% over 10 years. I don't know why they were put on a statin in the first place, but they were. Their cholesterols are like 202, which when I was going to my fellowship, was low. I mean, women had to have cholesterols over 260 before we even looked twice. And they're miserable. They, they used to run. They can barely walk now. You know, they can't get out of bed. They can't. And, and why? They, there's no data for benefit. And these people are suffering. And I'm telling you, for years, I have been seeing these men and women week after week. And without seeing data for benefit, I, I don't feel that I can look someone in the eye and prescribe a statin for primary prevention. So interestingly, recently data has emerged on women, and there was a meta-analysis that was done that looked at statins and, and benefit for women in particular. So what are your thoughts on that? Has that swayed your opinion at all? It was recently published by Costas and Jack. I, I did see the study. I um, noticed that they actually seemed a little confused on the definition for primary prevention because 40% of the people in the primary prevention had coronary disease, which means that it wasn't primary prevention, it was secondary prevention. They also had some other issues with their methodology, like the outcome they called their primary endpoint. They lumped every possible endpoint in all of the studies, and so it ranged from hospitalization for unstable angina or acute coronary syndrome, and then MI, non-fatal MI, and death. But when you lump endpoints like that, what drives them is the softest, you know, composite, in a composite outcome, what it's driven by your softest endpoint. And so I think there were some problems with their definition of primary prevention, which should not have included people with coronary disease, because that's not primary, and with their endpoints. So the soft endpoints don't convince you to start your patients on statins? 
uh, not for primary prevention. Like I said, what would convince me, I, I think the bar has to be high. When you're talking about primary prevention, you're talking about people like you and me. I mean, we feel good. I don't want to tell people to take drugs unless it's going to help them feel better or live longer. You know, a soft endpoint is not going to come. So would you consider a stroke or MI a soft endpoint? Stroke or MI are, again, for primary prevention, you know, if that translated into a benefit on mortality, that would be convincing. But so far it has not. I do think we could do a lot better with collecting data. I mean, we have millions of patients taking statins for primary prevention. I think we need to start putting them into registries so that we can actually follow them and collect data and then really answer these questions and stop having these kind of arguments. But right now, we don't have the evidence. Now, one of the issues that you've recently raised, Dr. Redberg, has been on the cost-effectiveness of statin treatment. Now, with Lipitor having gone generic and costing only $5 a month, has this changed your opinion at all on, on this treatment? Well, it's very interesting to say that because I've actually never raised the issue of cost-effectiveness. I mean, to me, before you can talk about costs, you have to show clinical effectiveness. So why talk about costs? For, I don't think... It's not the cost. That has nothing to do with it. You have to have a clinical benefit. For me to prescribe a medicine, the benefit has to outweigh the harm. And in your opinion, that benefit has to be a mortality benefit and not the MI stroke or other endpoints. Well, for a primary prevention, you have to have a mortality benefit. The bar has to be high for primary prevention. You're talking about millions of healthy people and putting them on a drug. You have to know that that's really going to help them. Thank you so much, Dr. Redberg, for sharing your opinions with us. I'm Pyle Coley here at ACC 2012. Thank you.